welcome to Read This and the Harlem Book Fair. I am your host, Alice James, and Max Rodriguez, the founder of the Harlem Book Fair, is here, and we are going to have a very informative conversation with three Jamaican authors. We're kind of looking at this segment as being a diasporic indie author's conversation. A lot of words there. But I would love to introduce you to our authors, Linda Edwards, Dale Mafood, and Andrine Bonnard. <laughs> Today, we are going to allow our guests to share a little bit about their inspiration to become an author. And we're going to start backwards. Since we introduced Linda first, we're going to allow Andrine to speak first. Give us some um, background about Andrine Barnard, the author. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be among friends. Um, let me first uh, say that I grew up in the vibrant city of Kingston, Jamaica, with my four siblings and parents who were both uh, teachers. And uh, watching both my parents and my oldest cousin Lou tell stories and sing gave me permission to explore my imagination. So as a child, I wrote stories uh, with illustrations and compiled them in little booklets. And in 79, I came to the United States uh, on a theater arts scholarship and later became an English language arts and theater teacher. I am a published author, that's why I'm here, <laughs> with a, a literacy fiction series and nonfiction books about student resilience, full-length historical cultural dramas and poetry. And I frequently perform praise poetry. Um, in 2019, I retired from the public school classrooms to establish Literacy Gateway Institute, where I train parents to become teachers and develop curricula and wellness tools. I'm an alumna of uh, the Lincoln Center Education Learning Labs for Artists and Educators, and I'm a member of the International Women's Writers Writing Guild and the Association of Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars. And then to relax, you know, I, I draw and I paint and I play Naya Bingi and Djembe drums, and I'm learning to play the guitar. I'm writing stories just for anyone who wants to learn about Jamaican history and culture and the religious freedoms that we enjoy. I think that was, I told a mouthful. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, would you, would you tell us a little bit? Certainly, Is certainly. There... I am honored also to be here with you, Alice, and with you, Max, and of course, my friends, Linda and uh, Andrine, you can see we have each other's books behind, <laughs> thick as thieves. Uh, so with an emphasis on the, no. Uh, so <laughs> I, I um, the first thing I remember writing was in high school and I wrote a, a poem about Rastaman and I have no clue what I was talking about, but you know, that was back in the seventies when Bob Marley and everything. So, and then from there, I remember, um, right, I, I would end up writing a lot of songs many of them worship type songs. And it wasn't until I went back to get my master's and took some creative writing classes that I really got into poetry. And I wrote a really nice short story about uh, sort of a auto fiction sh short story about me growing up in Jamaica. And then <clears throat> probably around 2008, 2009, we were sitting around the dinner table with my family and my mother. And my mother would always tell us stories about growing up in Jamaica in the country parts and uh, with a very bad father. Uh, and so uh, eventually I said, one night I said, listen, I'm going to write a novel about this. And everybody said, yes, you have to write a novel. So that's where my, my novel, When Trees, came from. It took me 13 years uh, for various reasons, but uh, that's kind of the inspiration for my writing. And Linda, 
Um, would you mind sharing your inspiration and a little bit about your background? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, I'm really honored to be in everybody's presence and to have this opportunity. So thank you very, very much. Eight generations of my family are buried on the island of Jamaica. My roots are planted deep within Jamaica and the Caribbean. Replanted roots that came from Portugal and Spain during the Spanish Inquisition. And they mixed with the English, the Scottish, the African, the Chinese. And this commingling created a history. And I've come to realize growing up in the Caribbean that the society that we created um, steeped in one love, the society of inclusion is a lot more complex than the history books would like us to believe. And I find that rich fodder for my imagination. So I tend to write about Jamaica. My first two books were based in Jamaica. My third book um, is based in Cuba. And my fourth book is based in Barbados, Jamaica, and South Carolina. So I try to find these little lost threads of history and try and give them a new tapestry to be woven into and tell our stories in a new and engaging way so that people can see we're a lot more than sun, sea, and sand. Amen. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Um, Gail, uh, uh, just quickly, you, I, I know Linda said her family is eight generations in, in, in Jamaica, and you said your family, when we were originally from the Middle East, right? Well, my dad's side of the family is from Lebanon, yes. Lebanon. And then my mom's side of the family, again, similar to, to uh, Linda, in, in Jamaica for many, many generations, Generation. mostly of a Scottish background, but mixed mixed British, basically. Yes. And very interesting. And then it's part of the reason I wanted to do this, too. It's just, again, that out of many, one um, conversation. So there's some very interesting names to your books. I would like to start with Dale and shared a little bit that your book came out of your family story, When Trees Fall. Okay, so When Trees Fall, there was, you know, there's there's a, a Caribbean cotton tree in Jamaica it, that was on my grandfather's property. And it, by the way, everything is really fictionalized in the story. I've just kind of taken the seeds from my family. But um, in the story, this cotton tree is there. Now, uh, Caribbean cotton trees are humongous with humongous roots. Mm -hmm. And it said, this tree was said to have been the tallest one and the oldest one in the Caribbean. And um, in the beginning of the novel, it's fallen. And in the beginning of the novel, my grandfather is is at they're at his grave so um really throughout the novel the tree is an important thing that keeps coming up and uh of course he he's it's fallen he's fallen and the story really is about him in so many ways so it's about i guess you could say his falling and the fallout from his his way of life and how it affected the three main characters um jump to Andrine and Andrine, you have two books that are centered around Jamaica. Long walk to, to Cherry Gardens. Long walk to Cherry Gardens. And of course, no life in Olympic Gardens. Yes. So that's my garden I'm working on. Yes. And um, well, I should I should call it a series because I have a sneaky suspicion something else is coming after the other one, but that's a whole nother, nother piece. Um, uh, it's the story of a young boy. I, I really like writing stories about boys um, because I enjoy teaching boys. I, I believe that boys uh, tend to need more lap time. And so I am very passionate and they were always very humble in my classroom. I really, really, truly enjoy teaching them. And so I wanted to write about them and for them as well. 
The story of uh, Roderick Brissett is about a boy who was abandoned in Jamaica by his white American father and his Afro-Jamaican mother became emotionally detached from him. Um, in, in Jamaican parlance, we would say, the man gone left her. And so she became emotionally detached from the little boy, sends him away to Kingston uh, to be with her sister, who um, relegates him to a life of servitude. And he becomes a little shop boy. And at a school age, he should be going to school. She denies him an education while she sends her uh, boys to school. Uh, that's in book one. Uh, he's really struggling to, to find his way. And then, then in book two, he's kicking doors down now because he is trying to find himself and his identity, who he really is. And then, of course, he is bombarded and, and uh, taken by family secrets in book two. Mm -hmm. And, you know all hell breaks loose. Okay. And um, so he's on a physical journey in long walk to Cherry Gardens, but he's also on a metaphoric journey, a journey to find himself. Okay. And, and Linda, I saw at your interview as you were speaking about your inspiration for Redemption Song, and that was formed through nightmares. That's an interesting inspiration for a book. Mm -hmm. Nightmares, please explain. Well, as a child, I always suffered from nightmares. And um, I suffered a series of losses, uh, an uncle that I was close to, my father, an aunt that I was very close to, all died within the space of three years. And I realized that I was at the point in my life where I was descending the hill instead of climbing. And I was afraid of losing the thing that meant the most to me. That was my rock, which was my husband. And I kept having these nightmares of, of him passing away and my very domineering family walking in, packing me up, taking me away from this incredible life that I had created with him and taking me back to Jamaica. And the thought of having to go back to that control where every decision about my life was made by committee, I, I just... I didn't want that. So these nightmares just kept coming. And finally, he got frustrated because I kept waking him up every time I had one. And he said, you know, there's obviously something on your subconscious. Just write it down. Just get it off your subconscious, put it on paper. Which I did. And that resulted in the first chapter of Redemption Songs. So the Redemption Songs is a fictional but contemporary telling of societal life in Jamaica. And it's about taking responsibility for oneself, righting wrongs, you know, recognizing duty, honor, responsibility. And, you know, realizing that themes of equality, loyalty, there's, these are all uniform, universal themes that are important to any society. But it's also the deeper message of love and loss and finding love again, even after betrayal, that makes redemption songs uh, uh, more of a enthralling read, I think. Okay, so let, let's get into who, Linda, who are you inviting in in the book? Wow, that's a great question. Um, Redemption songs, I honestly thought that I was just writing for family and friends. Um, I couldn't find anybody to publish it. I couldn't find anybody interested in it. So I said, you know what, I'll just write it for, for friends and family. And I loved getting the emails and the telephone calls. Oh, I know who you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. I know who you're taking a dig at with that one. I mean, that, that was fun. But then I, I, got a, I started getting emails from people who read the book and it meant something to them. They felt something reading it. And I thought, like, maybe I have something to say. 
And I remember getting an email from a lady who I later found out was, was African-American. And she used to go to Jamaica quite a bit. And she stopped going because of all the negative publicity that Jamaica was getting and the crime and this and that. She just didn't feel comfortable going anymore. And she, she emailed me. She said, I, I know that road that you're talking about that Josephine traveled. I've been on that road. I remember it vividly from your description. And I was so moved by that. And she explained to me why she stopped going to Jamaica and, and all of that. And I said to her, I, I remember emailing her back and saying, please go back, please go back and drive that road again, drive it with Josephine sitting next to you and see it through her eyes and enjoy it and feel the love that she feels for her, for her home. And she did it. <laughs> she went wow. to Jamaica. She, 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 did the drive and she came back and she said, I'm going back every year. And, you know, if I can, if I can do that and express my love for my island and my home through my words on paper, then yes, I have something to say. Of course. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to share? I, I know, Andrean, you said, it's for boys. Are are they little Jamaican boys? Are there boys all over the world? Oh, what boys be, all over the world. My, my classroom have always looked like the United Nations, you know? And so writing for boys, they were experiencing the same thing. The parents had the same anxieties uh, for all their children. And so I really enjoy writing for little boys, about little boys, but more especially, I, I wanted to um, introduce the world to uh, a culture and uh, a history where my books examine the intersection of both the conquered and, 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 and the conqueror. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to talk about what I was experiencing, what my, my, my students were experiencing here in America, the whole idea of race and class and colorism and culture, yeah. you know, resistance and triumph. And as Linda says, you know, the whole I, idea of the universality of the themes that I, I explore in the work, it speaks to um, what these young people are experiencing. But I also wanted um, my books to resonate with um, just about anybody. They're, they're human stories, mm. you know, again, about those themes, some themes that um, uh, Linda shared earlier about loyalty, betrayal, love, friendship, hope. And uh, everybody wants that. Or let me just not say the everybody, but most people, I believe, want that. And I, I wanted to just respond to the muses and to share that with the world. And, and um, Dale, is there any particular people? So when I first started out again you know, at the dinner table, my family, that was the the audience. I wanted my my children and you know family to be able to read and get a feel for what mm -hmm. it was like to grow up in the country parts of Jamaica. And so that was the first audience. And as I'm writing it, uh, I'm thinking, wow, this is good for Jamaicans as well, because I have Jamaican, the three main characters come from different parts. One is uh, Kaylin, she's from a great house in Jamaica, large property. Sharp, he's about 30 years old. He's he's African Jamaican, and he's the foreman for this property, and he lives in a very poor village. And then there's Archie, who is the um, son of um, the innkeeper that in the area. And they all, they're, they're from different parts of Jamaica, you know, and so I was like, and then I realized, because this is going to end up being a series of four novels, God willing. And I realized that with every novel, I'm going to explore a different ethnicity slash socioeconomic section of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I once heard, I don't, I cannot track down who said it, 
but mm -hmm. they said everybody everyone lives in their own jamaica and so when they said that i was like that's exactly what i'm trying to do i'm trying to give jamaicans a taste of the other jamaicas so they can go you know they can relate they may not yeah. you know in some way they can relate and it <laughs> was i would love it to unify even in, in a greater way jamaica and then finally of course everybody wants to write their novel for the world but mm -hmm. similar to what some things that were said already i think believe linda had said something I, I want people to realize that jamaica is more than just sand and beach and reggae and dance hall and all those things are great but there's yeah. so much more complexity and beauty the tapestry of jamaica is incredible so i want people to be able to experience that both from a historical point of view and just Jamaicans as we are. Max, I'm going to shift down to you for some of your questions and insight and what you want to share or ask. So, so, so the theme is, um, you know, out of many, out of, out of, what is the theme again, please? Out of? It, it's the slogan for Jamaica, out of um, many, one people. Out of many, one people, and then Dale's writing uh, speaks to uh, uh, informing readers of the idea of there are many different Jamaicas. So, so what what is that? What is that contradiction? Because that lands for me as a contradiction. Um, and and how you know how do we live? How do we live in that space? Now that's a rhetorical question, but my real question is as writers, do you feel any responsibility to sort of explore that space, to, to explain how the two actually live yeah. in parallel and harmoniously? Right. <clears throat> if I if I may take that, because that's actually the theme of my second book, Friendship Estate. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> In Friendship Estate, I look at colonial history. Um, colonialism is the greatest transgression humanity has ever perpetuated on itself. Yet, because of it, we have the opportunity to create the greatest civilization humankind has ever known. And in rewriting this dark period in Jamaica's history, mm -hmm. what I tried to do was to build a bond so strong that it tears through readers' hearts and breaks the cycle of racism and division by showing in friendships estate what might have been. I tried to point the way to what might yet be. You know, <laughs> I I like to say that Jamaicans never refer to themselves as anything but Jamaicans because. We are impressive enough with that name alone. And I think what we have managed to do as a society is to do what very few have been able to do. Use colonialism as a bond instead of what it was meant to do, which was to divide by race and class. What happened during the 1800s was that the discarded of the world were brought to the Caribbean. And then we became the disregarded. Yet we were able to create an incredible society where we all sound the same. Mm -hmm. We have this beautiful society of inclusion steeped in one love with its own musical soundtrack and cuisine. We all did that. It wasn't one race or another. It was all of us. The discarded, the disregarded became one out of many people. Very good. Who wants to follow up on that? I know. <laughs> My books um, are, she talked about the 1800s. I'm looking at the 60s and the 70s. Um, when we became we're post um, uh, slavery society um, with all of the ills and all of the vestiges of 
the dastardly acts of cruelty that were imposed on us. And, and as um, Linda stated that, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a very important uh, uh, saying in Jamaica uh, by the Honorable Dr. Louise Bennett Koval, as she say, we take, we hand, turn and make fashion, you know? <laughs> You know, and and um, That's exactly what we did. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. we, we take every whatever they them give we basket for carry water, but somehow we find a way for patch up the whole them and, and make it work so that we can become whole. You see, yeah. and um, so that is that is just something so very special uh, about um. The, the culture. And so I look at the 60s. Here we are coming out of the 60s and we come up with this fabulous motto, out of many, many one, one people. people. But the irony of the whole thing is we were like 92% African at the time. And so the other 8% we were looking at all of the other, other groups, you know, all of the, uh, the Asian groups, you know, the, the Indians, the Chinese, and uh, we're looking at, um, of course, the British, mm -hmm. um, Scottish. Uh, we talk about our Scottish heritage and our uh, French nobility and all of that sort of thing. We, we, we love to celebrate that, looking for that little drop of blood. And it, 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 it's a reality, you know? Um, and so we, that was an ideal that um, the Jamaican government and the powers that be wanted, even though it was 92% black and the 8%, but there was something about that melting of the people together. Yeah. Um, so in post-slavery, um, in, in, uh, in the 60s, we were looking at the independence from, from, from Mother England, we were creating our own dance theater company to express all of, of the intersection of all of the different cultures, you know, our African, our Yoruba dance, yeah. you know, um, our, our, our mother, modern um, dance with uh, Professor Rex Nettleford and, and, and Eddie Thomas and those people who came together to look at the mental music. And, and then of course we had the ska and the, then the reggae music. It, it's just such a beautiful time. But then what I want to share here is that politics, Politics, and we have to talk about that, Linda. We have to talk about that, Dale. We have to talk, politics is our breath. No. Like religion, politics is our breath. And so um, politics becomes a, a, a huge backdrop in, in my stories, my two stories. Um, the the country, country's coming of age. We are trying to pull away from, from, from Britain, which we have still haven't quite done yet, but uh, we're trying to pull away from it. And, um, and that's, that's what my, my two books are dealing with, how we got over that period of, of, of all yeah. those hurts. And we still struggle. We still struggle. I'm not, I, you know, we still struggle. But so much beauty comes out of our struggle. Again, the music that we have given, the, the, the artists that have taken over the world, you know, the imagination of the world. And our, our, our writing, Andrean, we were talking about this last night, our writing, you know. Yes. Great African orators. We in the Caribbean are in a very unique position because we had great African orators who were given from Europe our European heritage, pen and paper, yes. to record the history of an incredible people mm -hmm. that struggled and not only survived, but thrived. And the three of us have the privilege of telling those stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. But and and I, what's important is, is for us to be able to come together, like the three of us have come together and 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 be really saying, okay, we need to be a force to be reckoned with. Oh, we have literature, we have language, you know, um, we have written works of literary merit, but who's looking for us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for watching part one of Out of Many, One People, Jamaican Authors and Jamaican Story. Join us next time for part two when host Max Rodriguez will guide the conversation deeper into speaking truth to power with historical fiction. We would love for you to pick up our author's book so you will be ready for part two. Until next time, I am your host, Alice James, and this has been Read This.